Uh, let me see, would you get to get the presentation? I'll just say hi first. Uh, very impressive, Alf. I love his energy. Uh, unlike Alf, this is my first time speaking in public, so I hope you'll be kind. <laughs> I hope. I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. So I'm here when Ka Kathleen reached out and asked if I would come and speak tonight. And initially I had a kind of a, oh no, thanks, I don't actually speak in public uh, email ready to go back. Actually, it was there. And then I thought, actually, I, I don't speak in public, but I am a retailer and I have sat in seats like yours, looking at the stage, people like, you know, people like me now, uh, telling, I've listened, sat there, trying to figure out how to get online, how to go from bricks and mortar retail and to run a successful online business. I've tried that over the years. And so I have made that transition. And so that's why I'm here. And hopefully tonight I can give something of value to you. And if you have any questions afterwards, you can contact me separately. I'm very happy to talk to anybody if I can help them. I first made my journey into online about 12 years ago and from there. Just to give you a bit of background on the bricks and mortar, I come from a long history of retail on um, my dad's side of the family. And after a sort of a foray into banking, I decided that I was unemployable really, and I wanted to be self-employed. And so I headed into retail more than 30 years ago with a shop in Wicklow called Wardrobe. And over the years, added more shops. I have four shops now, four bricks and mortar stores, two wardrobe boutiques that sell sizes eight to 16, and two wardrobe plus stores that sell 16 to 32. And so th that they sort of naturally evolved over that length of time. Um, I suppose when I talk, I hear a lot of what Af says resonates, I suppose, with all of us because he's in customer service and it's all, it's what we live and breathe. And really the customer is king if we don't have a happy customer and we don't have a happy team. And I see my team as my first customer always and how I'm much more behind the scenes now. I'm the buyer, I'm in the office and how I interact with my team is key to how they interact with everybody else along the way. And I'm very, very conscious of the attitude I bring to work in the morning. And yeah, I'm very conscious of that. So maybe 10 or 12 years ago, like anybody who is here, who's been in retail a very long time, like the recession was very difficult. I'm, I, I can probably, I don't know where you're based and I don't know if you're online, but I, my first shop was Wicklow Town. Then I went to the village of Ashford. It's about the size of where we are now, like a no footpath, no passing trade. But there's a Mount Usher garden, there's a very nice garden across the way. And that did bring a lunch crowd um, from kind of March till October. And it was my cu customer and I actually opened a shop there. I took on what was um, a tool shed and I clad it in timber and I remade it and I made a, a shoe and clothes shop there. And after the recession, I'm, I'm there about 15 years. After the recession, it was just tough. Like we were working and not making much money. And... Um, so I just, I was looking for some way to diversify, some way to add value, to add some profit to the business and just keeping my eyes open for uh, new opportunities. I've never used one of these before. So let's see, does this work? Yeah. So our journey. Um, so I'm, I suppose I'm in the middle of, we had four bricks and mortar stores. I've, I found we, I had clothes that came in sizes eight to 16 and I couldn't actually source them in sizes 18 or 20. And I had customers that I just physically couldn't dress. So if they come into the shop and the 16 didn't fit them, I had to send them on their way. And that's very difficult as somebody in a business. Maybe somebody comes in, they want something for a party or work or just life and I couldn't fit them. And so I was going to my suppliers and they just didn't have the sizes I needed. They didn't make them. That has changed dramatically in the last three or four years. But 12, 13 years ago, uh, ranges really stuck to a, 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 like a band and there was not much movement in that bandwidth. So I just thought, look, let me see. I think there's a bit of an opportunity here. I didn't know the size of the market. I didn't know if there was a market. I knew that where I was based in Ashford, which was a village, that if I opened a store there, which I did, I would have to take it or try and take it national to have a customer base. I knew my customer base couldn't be local. I would never survive. I'd never have a business. And so we moved our store. That's uh, the outside of our Ashford store. Um, and we moved our store five years ago to a much bigger premises. Um, and we did actually, over time, make that transition. 
successfully to online um, after a lot of pain. So I love this slide actually because it looks like it looks so easy, doesn't it? <laughs> I, I look at that, I was doing up that slide and I was going flawless really, isn't it? It's 2016 bespoke website, 2018 phase two, a new website, 2020, another website, and then we did another launch again in 2023. It was the most up and down roller coaster of a journey. Um, the phase one website wasn't really fit for purpose. It was supposed to um, integrate with a, a pause, a Shopify, a, a till system, not Shopify, I'm on Shopify now. And the developer oversold. I didn't ask enough. I didn't ask the right questions. I didn't know the questions to ask. I asked questions, but not the right ones. So we ended up with a website that was difficult to update, I didn't look the way I wanted it to. I, I learned a lot. I think one of the things what I, which I would uh, recommend, like uh, when you're in a very small rural place, which I am, like your website becomes really important. It's that window to your customer. And whether you want to stay local and just have it for the customer at home who lives 10 miles down the road. And we get a lot of that actually, where it's, the, it's somebody living just over the road, but they're on your website at night and they're checking out what you have. And then they come in and they've seen it. Oh yeah, I saw you had that. Can I have it? Or So it's really important to show what you've got. And I suppose I think it, I would encourage people to move online. I think, look, we all have our phones in our pockets. We're all on, you know, it's, it's our laptops. Everything is digital. The, the newest generation are digital natives. It's, it's move online or eventually die in some ways. I, I just, I really strongly believe that. Now, I don't feel, I, I mean, I really feel the bricks and mortar are important to us and I'm about to open another store. Um, so I, I see it as a marriage of both, actually. I don't see it one without the other, but I do think the digital presence is key. So for, I, I suppose, online in 2016, I had this vision. I thought I was going to have this fabulous website. And when I got it, it didn't look fabulous. And it was very disappointing. Photography was very difficult at the time. The suppliers I was buying from didn't actually provide much by way of photography. Again, COVID has changed a lot of that as people moved online. So it was very difficult to get uh, product shots. And actually in a fashion business, we have 50 to 70 new lines a week. It's not a case of doing a fashion shoot, like a photo shoot once every three months and having th that imagery for your website for the next three months. It's every week. It's like a, a machine that you feed. And so really trying to get good photography is key for us. Our suppliers give us a lot now, but we do photo shoots in the office maybe once a week as well. I think photography is massively important to a digital presence, to um, your online. And I think that's something that I underestimate and I didn't fund properly in 2016. I also didn't fund a graphic designer properly in 2016 and I didn't update the website enough. That was, I suppose, my first learning. So I launched this website full of great hope and it didn't do anything, right? <laughs> and it didn't do anything for lots of reasons. It did tip away. I, I learned what didn't work. There's, uh, I always, I agree with, uh, I, when I heard Alf saying, uh, failure is feedback, for sure, failure is feedback. And I tried again, and I tried again. I was determined. I knew I wouldn't have a business without online. And so I, in 2018, I didn't have a lot of money. We'd invested a lot in the stores, and we were increasing our stock range. And my son, who was trying to give me a hand on his school holidays, his college holidays, to update the website, said, right, mom, I'm done. I'm going to build you a website over the summer, and it's going to go onto an easier platform. It'll be easier to manage. And that's what I did in 2018. So it was much easier to manage. I was a much simpler platform. Didn't have huge, like all the extra functionality and things that I have now, but actually it was a really easy to manage website. And I could update it and it, was, it just worked very well. So I was delighted with that. We had started off on phase one, deciding to actually fulfill from our store. And I don't know if any of you are online or how you're fulfillment, but we were fulfilling from one of the stores but the store was small and I had a lot of stock and it just didn't work well. And I knew that I was going to, so often what sells best and actually it's probably the 80-20 rule for a lot of you, you'll have like 
the 80%, the stuff that comes in every week to great fanfare is the lovely stuff, but the stuff that sells week to week, your best sellers over the year are probably for us like our 32.99 jeans and our 18.99 leggings that we store all the stock all the time and they're kind of fly under the radar. They're not fancy, they're not sexy, but they just sell. And so to stock enough of that like boring stuff, if you like, but stuff that really works, we just didn't have the space to do that in store. And so we decided in 2017, probably, I took on a warehouse and we decided to stock it as a third shop. And actually I decided online was gonna work and I didn't know how I was gonna make it work, but I was gonna make it work. So 2018, when we relaunched the website then uh, with my son's very cheap website, Again, we're learning, we're failing, we're iterating, we're trying something new all the time. We're now based in a warehouse and it's better, it's easier, except that I overbuy stock. I guesstimate, I have to project how much I'm gonna turn over, I get it wrong. <laughs> I'm a bit, I'm not hugely overly optimistic, but I'm overly optimistic and so I have stock left. So trying to balance that when you're buying three and six to 12 months ahead is a challenge. But I suppose it's something that comes with experience and comes with time. COVID hits. 2019, I decide online is going to be the thing. I'm going to move. So I moved to a bigger warehouse. I didn't have enough space where I was. Bear in mind now, it's not a success yet. We're, we're about four years in. I'm on the second warehouse, still determined to make it work and plugging away. And so in 2019, we're in a much larger space, still with the cheaper Sons website and easy to manage. And then COVID hits and the four shops close and there's sort of a disaster. We have very small customer base um, online, really. It's, you know, it's really, it's, it was an aid to the shop. It was our existing customers buying through social media, really, but we'd no reach much outside that. Um, I. I will never forget the day we closed our shops with COVID. I knew I owed a quarter of a million euros for stock that had all been delivered in the previous four weeks. And I like had very little of that online. And I, I had no nice photography. I had a team that was all gone home because the shops were closed. And I just thought, right, now is the time to make this work. And, and it did, we, we did make it work. It was a slog, um, but we got there and we ended up probably turning over a million and a half online that year and um, on my son's website. And so we did, we got that traction, put it in and probably the years of graft that we had done ahead of that probably really, you know, helped us to get there for sure. We had done the hard yards, made lots of mistakes and yeah, and we're still making mistakes, but we're still trying new things all the time. I think very open to failure, very open to opportunities, very open to information. I've sat in, in those seats in auditoriums so often at anything to do with digital and online and trying to get nuggets of information as to how I could improve what I was doing, like be best in class. We want to be best in class all the time aiming to be best in class in the stores as well as online. And actually one of the things that probably 10 or 12 years ago we did first of all was joined Retail Excellence maybe 10 or 15 years ago. And every year we uh, enter for the store of the year. We have a couple of stores that probably from their physical layout we're never going to win. But the one thing it does probably for the month of May every year, we pay about 130 euros, 150 euros per store to um, have a mystery shopper come. And that's fabulous feedback because the month beforehand, you do some extra training with the staff, you talk about like the merchandising standards, the service standards, the fact that we are aiming to make it through to the top 100. So two of the four made it through to the top 100 stores on, in last year and one made it through to the top 30. We'd won the year before, won a couple of years before that. So they know that actually we deserve our place in the top 100 stores in the country. And then we've been trying uh, for the online as well. So to come from where we were, um, we made the top five in 2022 um, for the small website of the year. And then in 2023, in November 2023, we won uh, medium online retailer of the year. And that was a fantastic boost to the team, really. Um, after all the hard work that has gone in. COVID turned everything around, I suppose, were more grants available and we were eligible for an Enterprise Ireland grant 
of, they had grants at the time, if you had a staff of about 10 and you had to have um, the ability or the desire uh, to export, um, the pro they would fund 80% of a 50,000 euro project. And that is something, that funding is not there at the moment. It has come and gone. They've done it 20, 21, 22, 23, I think, four years. Don't think it's on at the moment. But if any of you are in that realm of having a staff of 10 or more with an ambition to export, that's a fabulous grant to get because you'll just, you know, it's, it's, you get a whole lot of expertise and our digital maturity just came on tenfold. So in 2020, we got funding and we launched at the end of 2020 on a Shopify platform. I engaged a graphic designer uh, who's still with us on retainer. She's amazing. And um, every week we get new graphics updated for the website, updated for our emails, everything. So our, the look and feel across all our channels is the same. And actually that's probably some of the best money we spend. Um, we got the grant again in 21 and we used it for SEO, search engine optimization, conversion optimization, all of that. And then again in 22, we got the grant and we updated to Shopify 2.0 at the start of 23. So it gives us much more functionality at the back end. And we now have a suite of apps. Shopify, for anybody who's not on the platform, is a fantastic tool. And really, the functionality comes from all the apps that you add onto it, and you pay a subscription to all of them separately. It can be expensive enough to operate on, but it's a very easy platform, and it's possible to get it looking nice. So the plus factor, like bringing the store online. Uh, the one thing I'd say to you with any business, what's your USP? What are you really good at? What makes you different to somebody else? So when we're looking at our customer base, where we consider ourselves uh, the plus size experts in Ireland, we consider ourselves to be top of that pile, uh, we offer a very good personal shopping service if you want that. I did colour and style training myself about 20 years ago. We train the staff. So people come into us and they get really great customer service. Uh, our own clothing brand started about four years ago. It's been very expensive, not hugely successful, but we're trying it. We need that point of difference as resellers of other products. It's really important to have our own brand. And actually, we launched a new part of it for in January, and it's in the for quarter to date with the shops and the online. It's our third best-selling brand. And we're, so we're very happy with that and very, it, it'll never be, I don't ever want it to be a fashion brand really, it's more timeless pieces, but it's those pieces under the radar that we sell consistently all the time based on quality and fit. And then omni-channel retailer, we really see ourselves as it's really important to have one voice across all our channels, whether that's Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, whether you're in the store with us, if you're online, if you're on email, however you message us, uh, it's one voice, one look, uh, one lot of branding. And I think that's actually very important that you're consistent in your approach across everything that everybody is taking the same approach. We do two stock drops a week, Tuesday and Thursday. And everything goes live. So the, the, you know, we, use, we use Slack to communicate with the team. So they know the night before that these are the 20 lines going out tomorrow. An email goes out, so the, go out to the stock goes to the two shops uh, at a set time. We've extra staff in to make sure that the, they have helped to get the stock placed and merchandised and nicely put into the store. Emails go out to the customers on the two nights to coordinate with that. The stock goes live on the website. It goes live on our social channels, on our Facebook, on our Instagram, on our TikTok at the same time. So it's one approach to our delivery of stock and one approach to how we speak to the customer. It's not that it's live on the website today. It's not in the shop till tomorrow. Like it's just one approach. That's massively important um, if you're bricks and mortar and uh, e-com. So marketing channels, I just put this here because it might be of interest. When we started first, we had no money for budgeting, uh, no money for marketing. It was completely social channels. I presume you're all on social, social, like without social really, uh, online is very challenging. Um, good social channel will actually completely drive traffic to your website, for sure. You can do, we, we use social free and also paid. To do good paid social advertising, you need somebody external to help you. Even with, we have five in our marketing e-com office now, we still have external help with ads for um, Meta because it really, it's just tricky. And you will find people to help you, but I would say that it's worth paying somebody. 
email, the best, single best uh, marketing channel is email. It's your own data. The one problem with a lot of the rest of it is you're paying for it, you know, and, and you're paying, it's external, and once the ad is paid for, it's gone tomorrow. Email is our own data. It's people who've signed up to us. We, and then, you know, so we have connection with our customer, and it's just a very easy way for us to communicate with them. We try not to bombard them. We segment so that if we have, if we know that Kathleen likes X brand and uh, Michelle likes something different, you know, that we have, we, we don't, we don't cross-pollinate. We do a little bit of that, but um, a lot of the email marketing tools make it very easy to segment. Organic search, that's your SEO. When we launched our first website, I hardly knew what SEO meant. I did know what it may, meant, but I didn't know how to, how to do it. It's really about, um, I suppose, how somebody finds you online. If you have an online uh, presence at the moment, it's absolutely worthwhile going in, getting an incognito browser, open it up, and Google whatever you're selling, and see do you show up. Are you on the first page of a Google search? And if not, you have work to do on your SEO. And organic, organic work on your SEO, if you show up on the first page of Google, even if you're not paying for ads, you have some chance of being found. If, if you're not found, if you're on the second page, how often do we ever get to the second page of a Google, Google search? There's too many ads on the first page and too many people who are good at SEO, too many big companies. Like 10 years ago, a few Googles, plus size clothing in Ireland, every single company that came up, maybe bar one, were UK. Marks and Spencer, Yours Clothing, ASOS, that's who our competitors are. People ask who our competitors are. They're UK multiples with massive advertising budgets. And so, Actually, we do PPC, pay-per-click with Google. We do pay-per-click advertising now for the last couple of years. Again, you really have to do that externally unless you've got somebody quite techy on your team. Uh, it's very challenging to get that right. Um, but the advice that we got, and I think it's really good advice, you can decide you're going to pay. So say your website's not been found on Google. You can say, right, I'm going to throw 20 quid a day at it or 30 or 40 or 50. It's like throwing biscuits at a bear, really. They just, you know, they just snaffle up. It just snaffles up the money. But if you decide you're putting 20 euros a day into your Google ads and then the money is gone by lunchtime or it's gone by mid-afternoon, if you're not on page one with your SEO, well, then you're back on page two. At least if you're on page one and your marketing budget runs out at lunchtime or mid-afternoon, you've some chance of being found if you're on the first page. So getting somebody to work on your SEO is probably, like in, in terms of paid work, is probably one of those things that pays off long term. Often a blog post in whatever your niche is, whatever you're expert at, is a great way, you know, if you're selling heaters or paint, write a blog post about paint and write about post about trend colors for whatever. You can, you can make, I suppose, it's, it's about informing. Definitely blog posts drive traffic. It all helps your SEO. That'll help your positioning on Google. PPC, per per click, the best campaign we personally run is our brand, is our brand name. We run all sorts of display ads and we run shopping, Google shopping campaigns, but we pay for our own names. So that if somebody Googles Wardrobe Plus, that we'll actually come up so we come up probably first in, a, in a, the organic search, but in the ads we come up first because people will often hit on an ad before they'll come. You know, if we don't pay for our own name, they'll hit on an ad and skip our, us because maybe somebody has a shiny offer in the ad and that'll just, it's clickbait. So consider PPC if you're at that stage and then direct marketing. So social media strategy, again, I just put this up because it just gives you an idea of where we are now. We've gone from simply sort of 10 years ago having a simple strategy of like it was all about our social channels, mainly Facebook and then Instagram, with some paid ads on those channels. And now we have paid, owned and earned is the way we see it. So paid is our meta and Google and TikTok ads, and that is just outward going money all the time. We do manage our ROAS, we have weekly meetings and we track everything. We have maybe 20 different Facebook meta ads on every week, kind of retargeting uh, existing customers, new customers, collections, categories, driving people to different pages. It's a very rounded approach. Uh, our owned then, so that's our own, what do we own in terms of, we don't own that, like the minute we stop paying for the ads, they're gone. 
So what do we own? We own our Instagram and our Facebook following. The algorithms are tricky there. If they change, you're a bit bunched. You know, so it's trying to keep engagement. We, we post about seven times per day to Facebook. We're very, very consistent about that. We're out first at 7 a.m. every morning. Then we might do one at 10. We're live six days a week between 9 and 11. Then we're again in the afternoon and we're again in the evening every day. We get a schedule in the office from um, the team like, as to who's available on which day to do live videos so that we know ahead and we know exactly. And then they know what stock is coming because we've told them. And so uh, that's probably under organic. We don't pay to boost those. And then TikTok and email. Email again as our probably our best channel our most cost-effective way of advertising and then earned very important I've mentioned it before word of mouth massively important to us our customers are like completely uh, completely it's a return customer we have about a 90% returning customer rate my web developer tells me he's seen people selling addictive products that don't come back as often as they come back to us like we've we're massively reliant on returning customers and word of mouth and then all the places that we can get reviews. So this is earned, like people review us on Facebook, uh, on TripAdvisor, on Google, on Trustpilot, all those places that we probably have, I say no control over what they say. And then Judge Me, which is a web, an app that we have on our own website. Social media content. Um, our team, we've grown, we've doubled from about 20 to 40. Uh, over the couple of years, uh, from 2020 to 2024, we moved into a new headquarter building, um, uh, an office floor above our warehouse uh, last year, and that's our thing. Our team, we live and breathe this. We're caring, customer-centric, integrity, do the right thing at the center of everything we do. We're open-minded, we're resilient, we're passionate, we have a passion for excellence, we're respectful, and we have a winning mindset. I bring that to work every day with the team I work with, and I hope and <coughs> you know, expect that they bring that forward. It's in everything we do. And they're the strengths and values. I just, I think I have one here. What our customers say, actually this slide, uh, we're at 8,000 five-star reviews. And that's, we turned that on about two years ago. I love, I love these. And actually it's a great uh, boost for the team always to see that. They review not only the product, but also the service. And they also review uh, the service on the phone. So we give a lot of phone service, even though it's online, because it's all mixed up. People might ring and say, I don't know what size I am. I saw that, that thing on the video. Would I be a medium or a large? And we tell them. So sometimes the reviews will say, you know, I bought online, but I got great help on the phone. So the reviews are reflective of like the whole service. So it's really important to us that the person packaging the order, it goes out beautifully wrapped. The person dealing with the return, if we made a mistake or if they just didn't like it, they get a, a really timely um, return, uh, refund and very nicely and efficient. The same if they're in the store, it's all nice through. So actually the reviews there, it's really, it's as important to the girls packing the orders in the warehouse and unpacking the stock and dealing with the returns as it is to me and to the people dealing with the customers face to face. It is one customer across all our platforms. And the reviews are massively important to the team for a sense of how well they're doing. That feedback is really important. And then I think that is it. Top tips, if I have time for this, sorry. Um, so understanding your customer, what advice would I give? Who is your customer? Do you know your customer? And I would suggest if you're going online, try and niche down a little bit. Really, um, it's, it's very difficult to be everything to everybody. So understand your customer, where are they? Um, and what are their pain points? What problem can you solve for them? Like it's not about what you can sell to them, but what problem do they have that you can solve? So I, I could see that there were ladies who couldn't find nice things to dress, to wear that was well priced. 12 years ago, 13 years ago, when I was looking around, anybody selling plus size clothes just seemed to be frumpy, overpriced, and really old. And, and one of the things I set my mind was actually, I want to be able to sell like skinny jeans and a white t-shirt and a leather jacket, like for a hundred euros for the outfit. And I wanted to be trendy, machine washable. I wanted to be able to last for a year. And that was kind of that goal just to like democratize clothes. And and, and give that kind of to my customer. And that's, so that was the pain point that as I saw it, 
and of course everything is subjective, but I saw that as the pain point, that those clothes weren't available unless they were online, and understanding the market product market fit. I tried, opened with a very, I got a lease on a shop and I was open two weeks later. I went to Paris and I bought um, cash and carry stock, went to Ikea and I bought rails while the shop fit was being done. I got somebody to make a counter, got the painter in, bought hangers. I just had the stock back and steamed in a fortnight and I opened the shop. I just pulled the plaster and did it. And absolutely with loads of problems. You know, like did it work? No. But did I learn? Yes. And did I not like waste too much money or too much time. It was like you're going to, once you try something new, it's test and fail and iterate and try again. And actually it was a great way to do it because I didn't lose that much money and I learned a lesson each time I tried something new. Um, understanding the market, understanding your business, what's your point of difference? What are you really good at? You're all really good at something here, all really good at it. And online it's about trying to get that message across and trying to find that niche for that customer, trying to speak it. Build your brand online, be recognizable, that tone of voice, your branding, how you look, how your shop looks, how your packaging is, all of that. Um, your social media channels, crucially important. Where are they hanging out? Like if you were in a service industry, it might be Twitter or X, or it could be LinkedIn. If you're retail, it's probably Facebook and Instagram. And if you're in a younger market, it's TikTok. What are your opportunities and where are your weaknesses? Like I, I certainly have plenty of those. So it's really important to be aware of your weaknesses. And now I hire people who are much better at me than me at certain things. And that's fantastic. And I go in, we were trying to think of a name for something the other day and I was going, that's not my strength. And they're all going, no, that's not your strength. So we can laugh about that. Um, keep, the, keep the heart beating. So test and test again, be real, show your personality. I think people like that actually. Remain committed and consistent and customer engagement is key. Actually, I don't know if any of you know EJ Menswear in Sligo. Does anybody know EJ? He's nuts, anyway. Uh, but if you want to see like a great personality on social media channel, uh, he's there. I'm from Enniscorthy originally. There's a guy down there, Dermot Kavna. Uh, he's a couple of years older than me and he's in a very old fashioned hardware that's been there for like donkey's years, hundred years maybe. And uh, it's, Smith's, it's Smith's home line, I think. And he's nuts. I went onto his page, it, something popped up the other day. He's selling halogen heaters right now, not, not the most sexy product. You think, how could you make that funny? He's standing there dressed in his winter clothes and he's freezing and he's saying, oh, I'm so warm because of this heater. And he strips off to Hawaiian shorts and a t-shirt on a video, right? It's, a, it's nothing, it's rubbish, but it's really engaging and it's full of personality. And no matter what you're selling, you can bring your personality to your business and to your online. So uh, that's it for me. Uh, I hope you found something of value there. If I can help you at all, uh, seriously afterwards or even um, further down the line, if any of you want to make that journey to online and you want any help, be only too delighted. Thanks so much.